Hello and welcome back. As you may be anticipating, this is a Hopkins Library off week, but I managed to get one film from the McNaughton Popular Viewing Collection. It was brand new and it was there, so I went for it. This is The Joneses, starring David Duchovny and Demi Moore as the matriarch and patriarch of a of sort of a fake family that I believe, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe they go around moving into neighborhoods and convincing their neighbors to try new products, as in keeping up with the Joneses, I think. I don't know. It was a cute premise, and I like David Duchovny, so give it a shot. Next, from University of Baltimore, I got The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Now, I have seen this one. And my first peeve with it is with the title, which is not this, these filmmakers' faults at all, because this is a Swedish film, and it had, it's based on the novel by Stieg Larsson. And in Swedish, the film has the same title that the novel originally did in Swedish, which translates as Men Who Hate Women. But for some reason, the um, publisher decided to change the title to The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, because, I don't know, I guess audiences can handle what actually happens in the book and the movie, but they can't handle the title Men Who Hate Women. I don't know. But I just hate the title The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo because it really gets my goat when people refer to female persons 18 years and older as girls. It's like, no, they're women. But um, besides that, here's my take. There are, we all know, there are films that are really kind of exploitive, exploitation films, and then there are more serious dramas that deal with heavy topics. And I love exploitation films. A few of them sometimes get a little mean-spirited for me, and those I turn off. And I like serious dramas, not all of them, but some of them. What I don't like is when something is basically an exploitation film, but has kind of a pattern of seriousness and high moral intent. And this was a little bit the way I felt about this. I just felt like there were a lot of scenes that were kind of exploitive, didn't really do that much for the plot, and yet it had this kind of high tone to it. I have not read the novel, but I've heard that the, the film is pretty faithful to it. On the other hand, I thought it was well produced and well acted. Um, it's two and a half hours long, but it didn't really feel like two and a half hours. It moved really fast. And so I really can't say I would highly recommend it, but at the same time, it was pretty enjoyable viewing. Next, from Stevenson University, I got The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And let me just say, unbearable is right. This was just, ah. Uh, um, I had actually tried to watch it before and gave up on it. It's three, it's three hours long. Three hours. And I think I gave up about an hour in. But this time I'm kind of in my second chance mood and this is another one of those films that Criterion released and I thought oh, I should give it a try. I made it all the way through this time and I think maybe I was just in a better mood this time around because I still thought it was awful but this time I thought it was kind of I just kind of laughed. I, I was just, I found it pretty amusing. This is directed by the same guy who did Henry and June. And I found them pretty similar. They're both just unbelievably pretentious and really self-consciously sort of erotic with a capital E, but just laughable. In this, there's a line when um, they're going to be taking, a, two of the characters are going to be taking a train and the woman, I'm going to crack up. The woman says to the man, I love trains. They're so erotic. <laughs> and um, also, all these actors, um, it's, I mean, it's a pretty respectable cast. It's Daniel Day-Lewis, Juliette Binoche, and Lena Olin. And they all have these horrible accents. And it's like, yes, we know it's taking place in what was then Czechoslovakia. You really don't need to try hamming it up with the accents, especially when you're not terribly good at them. It was just, this was painful to watch, and I wouldn't recommend paying money for it. You know, either renting it or Netflixing it or 
God forbid, buying it. But, you know, if it's at the library or if it's on TV and you're just in the mood to snicker, you know, why not? It, it was kind of a hoot. And next from the Enoch Pratt Free Library, I got two more films by Marco Ferreri. You may remember last week I had checked out La Grande Bouffe and really liked it. And I'm just, I'm addicted to Ferreri now. And they got a big box set of Ferraris. So I figured I could only handle two this week. And the first one I got, which doesn't have a great cover, it's just the generic Marco Ferreri collection cover, was House of Smiles. This one starred the great Ingrid Tuline, and it's about a woman who gets sort of sidelined into a nursing home and her antics there and she finds love with one of the patients and but it's all told with this great Ferrari sort of raunchy but kind of intelligent at the same time humor but so imagine that on top of a story that's sort of Boynton Beach Club meets um, Tokyo Story or Make Way for Tomorrow and you sort of get an idea I found it enjoyable. It's not my favorite. I think my favorite is still La Grande Bouffe, but it was really enjoyable. And then I also got Bye Bye Monkey, which I have not yet seen. And this one stars Gerard Depardieu and Marcello Mastroianni. And it's in English, which was kind of a surprise. And this one, um, I can't quite recall what the plot is supposed to be. And as I said, I haven't seen it. but. I remember reading about it and thinking that sounded very Ferrari-ish and absurd, so I'm looking forward to it. I also got Pygmalion, starring Leslie Howard. This is a classic adaptation of the George Bernard Shaw play, which also was the basis for the musical and the film My Fair Lady, and have not yet seen this one either. And then for my Masterpiece Theater selection, I got both volumes of Edward and Mrs. Simpson. This one is based on the true story of the king who chose to abdicate in order to marry the divorced woman he loved. And I, I haven't watched this yet, but I was under the impression that they met when she was divorced and they fell in love. But judging by the synopsis on the back of these, it kind of sounds like she got divorced because of him. And that sort of adds some complications to it and may also explain why I was not allowed to see this when it first aired. Although it might also have been because I was on, it was on too late and I was a little kid. But I'm looking forward to finally seeing this. And if you've made it this far, thank you for watching and I hope you'll join me for my next video.